Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explain. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is accidental nuclear war. In previous lectures, we've seen strategic reasons why you might not want to develop nuclear weapons. You could be worried about, for example, preventive war or economic sanctions being levied against you. Now we're transitioning to a strategic reasons why you may rethink proliferation. These are issues that make nuclear weapons look less attractive than you may otherwise think. In this lecture in particular, we're focusing on nuclear wars that no one wants to initiate, but nevertheless are happening anyway. To motivate this concern, I'm going to start off with two close calls that occurred during the Cold War. Then I'll transition to estimated probabilities of accidental nuclear wars overall, and talk about some of the things that the United States and the Soviet Union and now Russia have done more recently to mitigate that risk. Let's start things off with October 25th, 1962, and the Cuban Missile Crisis False Alarm. A little bit of background. During the early parts of the Cold War, before satellite technology had become widespread, the United States relied on the U-2 spy plane to take high-altitude flights over enemy grounds and take images of the surface below. An October 1962 flight over Cuba took this photo. To the untrained eye, it might not seem like a very big deal. But analysts in the United States knew exactly what they were looking at. Soviet ballistic missiles capable of striking targets inside of the United States. This revelation began the Cuban Missile Crisis. For the next 13 days, President Kennedy and his closest advisors grappled with how to deal with the situation. Eventually, the Soviet Union and the United States reached an agreement. The Soviet Union would remove the missiles from Turkey, and in return, the United States pledged to not intervene in Cuba and also would remove missiles in Turkey. While the Cuban Missile Crisis ended peacefully, this is the tensest period in the history of mankind. People thought that a nuclear war could begin at any moment. With that background, let's talk about what happened on October 25th at an Air Force Command Center in Duluth, Minnesota. At around midnight, a guard noticed an intruder climbing the fence. Given the tensions of the situation with the Cuban Missile Crisis, the guard opened fire immediately. U.S. intelligence suspected that in the event of a Soviet first strike, the Soviet Union would initiate a sabotage campaign with intelligence assets it had within the United States. As a result, this intruder at Duluth was not only concerned to that particular area, but others around it. As a result, an intruder alarm was set off at all of these facilities. Unfortunately, the wrong alarm went off at Volk Field in neighboring Wisconsin. Rather than signaling an intruder, it instead told the interceptors stationed at Volk Field to scramble into the air. There was a Soviet attack underway. Fortunately, an official at Volk Field communicated with Duluth and found out that it was just a false alarm. Someone jumped into a car, blazed down the runway, flashed their lights, and made sure that the planes that were about to take off would stay put. What caused that false alarm in Duluth? It turns out the intruder scaling the fence wasn't a Soviet spy. It was just a regular bear. Not a Soviet bear, a standard American bear. Another incident worth talking about occurred on September 26, 1983. This time, it was the Soviet Union's turn to have a false alarm. Once again, some background is in order. In the years leading up to this incident, tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union were rising. The United States had recently put a lot of Pershing II missiles into Europe, capable of striking the Soviet Union with nuclear armaments. Ronald Reagan had come into office with more heated rhetoric against the Soviet Union. The United States had begun investment in the Strategic Defense Initiative, an expensive and ambitious plan to create systems to shoot down incoming Soviet missiles. You may have heard of this as Star Wars, because part of that plan was to use lasers to accomplish the task. Either way, the Soviet Union did not appreciate this, because it represented the beginning of a new arms race. 
and on top of all of that was Korean Air Flight 007. This was scheduled to go from Alaska to South Korea. You'll notice the indirect flight route because that stick of land jutting out was part of the Soviet Union. And unsurprisingly, at the time, the United States and Western countries did not fly direct routes over this area. However, due to an error, this is the flight path that Korean Air took that day. As the plane penetrated Soviet airspace, the Soviet Union scrambled interceptors. They did their job shooting down the airliner. Making matters worse, Congressman Larry McDonald from Georgia was on that flight and died. With all of that background, something interesting happened on September 26, 1983, at an early warning radar installation outside of Moscow. Stanislav Petrov was in charge that day, and he had one job. If the installation detected an incoming missile, he was to report it to his commanders so the commanders could initiate a response. And sure enough, the radar detected a lone U.S. missile coming in, ostensibly to nuke the Soviet Union. Compounding the problem was that Yuri Andropov was the leader of the Soviet Union at the time, and he worried that the United States would launch this sort of surprise attack. Petrov was very careful in his warning to his commanders. The installation detected just a single missile, and Petrov reasoned that if the United States were to initiate a surprise attack, it wouldn't fire just one. It would fire all sorts of missiles at the Soviet Union at the same time. It turns out that Petrov was right. That lone missile coming into the Soviet Union wasn't a missile at all. Instead, what the radar had actually detected was a high atmosphere cloud. These are just a couple of examples, so it's worth thinking about the overall estimated risk of accidental nuclear war. And in some ways, in those two examples, despite the concerns that they may raise, we were actually fairly lucky. Imagine that the scramble alert hadn't gone off at Volk Field where interceptors were, but instead went off at an Air Force base that contained nuclear bombers that might scramble into the Soviet Union and start launching nuclear weapons. Or instead of Stanislav Petrov being on duty that day, a more hawkish leader was there instead, and when he saw that the radar was going off, he then told his commanders that they must attack immediately. Well, a couple of studies have tried to look into this. The first one focused on launch-on-warning situations. These are defense postures where you launch nuclear weapons when you receive an alert about an incoming nuclear weapon, rather than wait for a weapon to detonate. This is common when tensions are high, and you can understand the strategic reasons for why that's the case. Imagine that the United States knew where the Soviet nuclear installations were. Then it could launch nuclear weapons at those nuclear installations and destroy them all, thereby denying the Soviet Union a chance to even use those weapons to retaliate. By the time they would know what has happened, they would be gone. Well, according to this study, if we were to have a long launch on warning crisis, then the risk of nuclear war would be about 50%. A different study looked at the overall probability of war, and it estimated a 2.1% chance per year of a nuclear war occurring during the Cold War. These concerns have in part led to a change in the nuclear postures of the United States and the Soviet Union, and now Russia. This is the number of nuclear weapons that each of those countries have had, ranging from 1986 to 2006. 1986 represents the all-time high. And you can see that thereafter, there's been a decline. And that is, again, in part due to concerns about accidents. The more nuclear weapons there are out there, the more likely we are to have some sort of accident come along with them. And when you're less concerned about tensions because the Cold War is ending, then having extra nuclear weapons just represents extra risk and not much strategic benefit. And so we see a decline in the number of nuclear weapons worldwide. That wraps up this lecture on nuclear accidents. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.